This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And what a journey this is. My guest this morning is a dear friend, but all of you know I only talk to dear friends. And this is one of those that I have known since he was a little boy. And now I am so proud of Eric Gill. I'm absolutely delighted with you and all of the people that were on strike for 50 some days. And now, ta -da, here we are. So welcome, Eric. It's delight. I am so excited about seeing you this morning. How you doing? Great, you know. It's um, there, you know. I mean, this is this is what I live for. Yes. You know, seeing working people having, you know, just just having the unity and the the bond between them, the solidarity. The you know, seeing working people have power. That's that's what I live for, and so every every smile, every hug, it's. Um, I mean, that's what I live for. So this is <laughs> this is one of the few times I really, really love my job. Oh, come on, you you give it your all. Now, for those of you, I said I've known him since he was a little boy, and that's because I knew his mother and father, uh, who were the bedrock of the Democratic Party. And his father was a congressman and had, I'm trying to do this, and when they were in D.C., was how old were you when you were in D.C.? That's when I met you, <laughs> when you were in D.C. Uh, seven, eight. Seven you know, or eight, like yeah. That. See, he's grown quite a bit since then. <laughs> uh, his father was responsible, he was the floor manager for LBJ, for President LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that's a very special thing, a special time in my life anyway. And so we have just been friends ever since. So Eric, tell us about you and Local 5. I did, first of all, how did, how did you get to be Local 5 when you, when it started out, it was just hotel and... No, we've been Local 5 for years, so since, well, pretty much since they chartered the local in 1938, we've been yeah. Local 5. It's the, the name and the branding of our international union affiliation has, has changed over the years. You know, it, we were once hotel and restaurant hotel employees and, and bartenders. Yes. Uh, but but most, many of our unions like ours have been resulted from different craft, you know, we used to have a waiters and a waitresses union a oh, hundred yeah. years ago. Yes. You know, and, and there was a bartenders union. It was like on craft basis. And um, when Local 5 was formed, and, and quite properly, uh, it was those craft locals were, were, were formed into a, what's called an industrial union, which is a union that has multiple crafts, but people all working in for the same company. Obviously, that gives uh, strength and power, having all the workers in you know, basically under one roof in, in one union, able to work together. And so, um, you know, our, 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 our union was founded in 1938. And um, I got to say, much of our current strength, and I, I give complete credit to my predecessor, you know, Art Rutledge uh, put together a very strong industrial union. And, and he, um, you know, he added pieces in that most of our unions, uh, local unions across the country that are affiliated with our, our union, Unite Here, um, for example, don't have front desks or accounting. Um, right. Many of them don't have uh, engineering, uh, you know, the maintenance departments. And some of those are in other unions and some of those are in uh, just non-union in other towns. And we have all of those. And that wasn't an accident. Our ran a program to, to make that so. In fact, our clerical workers, our front desk and accounting and, you know, PBX and so on, they organized in 1960. <laughs> the company didn't want to recognize them to join the union. And 
they all walked off the job and went down to the labor board. You know, they did a job action and, and got in the union. So our union has always had, um, you know, first of all, structured correctly in terms of being able to exert the most unity, the most power, you know, in, in our environment, but also a, a fighting tradition, um, you know, that even today, you know, I mean, obviously, most of the people who had the, the fights in the 50s and 60s are, are not with us mm -hmm. anymore. Right. But, but nonetheless, you know, the tradition has, has carried on. Because and so our, I'm proud yeah. of our generation here having, you know, put a nice, nice touch on that. Yeah, because um, I think, now, yeah, somewhere way back here, um, once the agriculture people uh, that is sugar, pineapple, those right, uh, dock workers were able to break the big five, then along comes tourism, which was, they could get away with not paying much <laughs> for the workers in the tourist business. Yeah, well, the big five is us. I mean, what is now owned and operated, uh, the, the, the hotels we struck were owned by Madsen, you know, definitely yeah. a you know, the subsidiary of the big five, to, so to speak. And so they're still there? Well, the uh, Osano family bought them from Matson back in the 60s. And uh -huh. so we've been, you know, with uh, under Japanese ownership since, you know, since I was in grade school. Um, but, um, you know, and, and we've had, you know, ups and downs over the course of, you know, what, 60 years or whatever. Um, you know, so there's nothing particularly new about what happened? It's new for the people who are new, new to, it. to it. Yes. But you know what? What what we saw was a readjustment in a power balance um, between the management and the workers. And you know look, we're we're married to the company. I mean, the truth is we're yeah. married to them. We have we have a contract. We're we're married to them. And then like any relationship, you get into occasional you know spats and stuff. The key, the key to preserving a relationship, though, is is not whether you get into a fight, but how do you conduct it and how do you how do you end it? And so, right now, that's you know we're very much focused on getting back to work, and you know, really, we we have a mutual interest. We want the business to come back. That's our work. Yeah. And we want the business to succeed because otherwise we can't get raises. And so, you know, we, we went through a period of time where the differences between us became the main thing. But we're going back to work, and, and what unites us with management is, is, is increasingly there because we all have to operate the hotel together in order to make money. And they, they certainly found that out. Yeah. Without us, <laughs> they weren't doing too well. well. Yeah. And you know, and obviously we we need them so that we can have somebody signing our paychecks. You know, so so this is part of a, a whole, you know, I call it kind of a dance, but it's really more of a, you know, it's more like plates on the earth. You know, we rub against each other. There's earthquakes. You know, but generally there we are, and and we're all on the same earth together, and we all work in the same community, and and so. You know, I, I think my members have been, I mean, they're just overjoyed that that they know now that they have the power to power, do this. Yes. And and so for my members, you know, it's it's not just relief. There's plenty of relief. Oh, finally, we get to go back where there's plenty of joy. They go Look back at, to work tomorrow, is that it? Uh, yeah, most, most mm -hmm. of them. I mean, Thursday, be, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be obviously a process. But, but, but really what they got was a taste of power, a taste of solidarity, a taste of... Of, of what's potentially there for workers in our society, you know, that mm -hmm. we, we don't have to be downtrodden, we don't have to be, you know, feel like small potatoes and helpless and all those things that, that working people say, you know. And it's people's biggest excuse for not voting or getting involved in politics, ah, small potato, not going to matter. The truth is, we, we more than just matter. Working people organized together are a necessity in our society if we're going to have a democracy. If there's going to be any what? any power balance between the wealthy who've got it all their way right now, getting all the tax breaks, getting all the, the permits, everything they want, the, the government just gives them gives them our tax money. The only effective counterbalance to that is working people, and we're only effective in in that if we have power, and that 
means we have to build our unity, and really that's what we've done over the last uh, now, over the last weeks. You have people at the hospitals also. Were mm -hmm. they on strike? No, we, no. Look, we we did not attempt to strike everybody we represent. We we, we are very conscious of our power and the limits of our power. Where mm -hmm. you know, if we tried so to strike the hotel, the hospitals weren't. No. Not all the hotels either. You know, mm -hmm. we, as a union, we recognized, and this was, you know, several years ago, we recognized that we have a new kid on the block, you know, with Marriott eating up Starwood and becoming twice the size of Hilton, four times the size of Hyatt, you know, and rapidly growing. You know, it, this is, it's kind of like uh, the Frankenstein monster, you know, getting loose. And, and so we recognized that we had to have... Uh, a rearrangement of the power balance with with the hotels but if you're going to do that you got to take on the biggest one yeah if you're going to have an impact on all so you know we knew we had to have a reckoning with Marriott you know Kilia is uh, runs the Marriott flag and they're you know so so they're in this mix but you know Kilia is a different owner and they have an independent view from Marriott as well. You know, mm -hmm. Sometimes those two entities don't get along very well. So we, we ended up striking um, five hotels out of you know several dozen. Um, we didn't attempt to strike Hilton and Hyatt and try to, you know, we, we, what we're doing is called pattern bargaining. We, we take the biggest one and we get the deal and we go to the next biggest one and it's like, here's the deal, right? This is it, yeah. This is it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and we'll see how Hilton responds to that. You know, this is a rich contract. I'm not yeah. sure what they're going to do. Well, we need to take a break, and we'll be back in 60 seconds. Hmm. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger, and hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Best kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Aloha. I'm Marcia, and we are back with my dear friend, <laughs> Eric Gill, from Local Five, and they just completed what a journey! My God, um, what fifty-one days, fifty something? Yeah, it's fifty-one days. Fifty-one days, and yes, yes, this is mine, <laughs> and I wore it, and I walked the picket line, and I carried picket sign, and people would ask me, "Are you really working at a hotel? Aren't you kind of old to be <laughs> working at a hotel?" <laughs> <laughs> well, not really, Marsha. <laughs> but I was out there. I was out there. Yeah. We got many members who are, who <laughs> yeah, are your I, age I and was older. <laughs> walking the picket line. But now, there was one thing that really interests me, and that is the hotels talking about robots mm -hmm. and the thought of the front desk with a robot. How do you check in? And people come to Hawaii because they want them the Hawaiian experience. How do you get a Hawaiian experience with a robot? Well, apparently they teach teach the robot to say, mahalo. Oh my God. <laughs> and that kind of thing. Well, look, you know, I mean, they, you know, to be clear, our, our society is driving the production of robots. And, you know, the government's doing that because they want Terminator 2. They want war bots, you know, they want, they want drone attack craft and all that stuff and and it's happening very fast because the government is putting these huge tax uh, credits you know to yeah. basically fund this research so so our government both state and federal is is giving huge monies to these robot and it's not just robots 
robots is kind of like the easier thing to see. You know, we're talking about smart algorithms that that can coordinate activity across department lines. You know, we're talking about pads on the tables where instead of a weight help, you, you know, you just hit the buttons on the pad and, and somebody comes and brings you a bag of food. That's already out there in many airports, you know, where some airports you don't see any human being actually serving food, taking orders. It's all done electronically so, now. So they would replace that in the hotel? Well, they're already working on it. The uh, Marriott has already run out its app. It's a similar app to the one I used to get on the plane, you right. know, from the airline. You know, it puts a little URL code and you can use your, your phone and hold it up to the to the, the little pad in the door and it'll it'll open the door for you. So it's possible and they're they're advertising this that you can go from the plane to the room and not have to stop so to talk to So How do they replace real people your people in the service industry. Well, How that's, do you what do that? that's what they're doing. Uh, you know, we would anticipate, I mean, if you look at where they're going with this, the, um, the hoteliers are basically, the owners and these operators are basically dominated by big private equity, you know, I mean, these right. big, huge corporations that are doing this at the airlines too. So when was the last time you went and checked in with a real human being to get on a plane flight? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's but, just there's too few of them. They're only handling the baggage tagging. Everybody else goes to the kiosk, right? So, so how do that's, you do that with with the room service? Well, they're eliminating room service. The, but what do you mean they eliminate? They're eliminating room service. room service. But so I mean, I can't call and have breakfast brought up to the room. In many mm -hmm. hotels, no. However, oh. however, now they're backfilling that. So I got a picture on my phone of this robot standing in this little niche in a hotel in Los Angeles and it basically has a, you know, I mean, that robot can open up its head compartment, you put your order in there, your hamburger and everything, oh. and it'll come buzz its way up and it's going to knock on your door or hit the button on your door and you get there and you open it up and there's your food. And look, there's... And well, what about the beds, making beds and especially here, those 800 pound mattresses, how do you yeah, you know, some you of that stuff they haven't gotten to yet, and it may be too expensive to deploy, but they've already, they've already running out these robots. They're calling Rosie that'll buzz around and do the vacuuming. You see them on TV, right? But these are the real smart ones, that, an algorithm that can get behind the toilet and make sure it does everything. It doesn't just bounce off the wall, you know? And so, so they're already touting these at trade shows, saying, you know, with, these, with this kind of uh, technology, one housekeeper can do the work of three. So what do we do with the other two? You know, and what does Hawaii do without the, the, the paychecks of those other two? And right. where, what about the tax? You know, robots don't pay tax. No. You know, so, so you know, we have a real problem here that's bigger than just our industry. It's, it's, a, it's a problem in society where work that people need is going to be increasingly unavailable and be done by machines, and yet society hasn't done anything to address the impact on people. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, in a way, we feel like we're not just fighting for our contract. We're kind of like, let's shoot up the, the flares here, community. Let's look at this. You know, if, if, if we lose, you know, half of our, half of our uh, front desk jobs, and if we lose, you know, two thirds of our housekeeping jobs, it's a huge blow to our tax base. As, it is. As well as to, obviously, to each of those individual families. So, you know, we're not, you know, we've always seen this strike as we're not just fighting for us. When we, we say one job should be enough, that we think that's true for everyone. We, not everybody has a union that can fight for it. Right. But we can show people that you can fight for it. And well, the same thing on the tech, you know. Well, well now, the, um, I, 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 I'm still puzzled as to why, they, how they think that because people come to Hawaii for the experience, and the first thing they say, oh, we're the Hawaiians, and robots aren't Hawaiian. Hmm. They look for this experience, and how do you, I, I, well, I, 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 you can tell I'm flabbergasted. No, I, 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 think, I think the big, you know, we've had these conversations in my position. I end up having conversations with billionaires and people that, you know, that, that we'd have to deal with. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, 
my, my impression is that the industry feels, or at least some elements in the industry feel, that people will accept these lower service standards the same way we've accepted a much more terrible experience in our airplane flights. Right. You know, you don't even get a pillow anymore, right? You don't get you don't get a meal anymore. You 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 get crammed in. They make the seats smaller and smaller. You got to check in at a kiosk if the if the machine doesn't check in, you can't find anybody. But we're still flying, mm -hmm. and so I think that's where you know when, when we talk about the people that own and operate our industry, and 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 I'm, I got to make a, uh, an exception for the Osano family. You know, I mean the truth is we struck the people who actually are more committed to service, which is in a way one good reason to do that because they're willing to give us uh, some guarantees on service standards. Some of these other hotels, there's no guarantee at all. They, they are testing what the traveling public, how much reduction the traveling public is willing to accept. When Hawaii room per room has the highest room rate in the country, and we have a 365-day season, which New York and L.A. don't have. Mm -hmm. Paris doesn't have, you know. So they're making money all year round, highest, highest in the nation. So what's the issue with why do they need robots to cut back on? Well, you know, these are... The people that are making the decisions here are not. Don't live you know, here. Not they in, don't. Don't no, they're travel. Not even, they're not in hotel business. They own hotels. They buy them and sell them. They're real estate people. Ah. And so for them, you know, it's a question of um, how much yield and you know, how much profit do you make per square foot. So that's the been the pressure on our restaurants, many of whom break even at best, and most of whom lose some money. The people that run the hotel that want to sell hotel rooms and host guests, they want to keep the restaurant. Right. Because that helps you sell of hotel course. rooms and take care of the guests. And not least because, you know, the, some of the losses in the restaurant is because somebody gripes about having a hair on the, on, on the mattress or something and they give them a free meal. You know, so they use the restaurants as their kind of complaint department. And, and obviously that burns us because then they say the restaurant's losing money and blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, these guys are real estate people. They look at that restaurant space, just using that as an example. Here's a square foot that I could be losing 10 cents a, uh, you know, 10 cents a month on that square foot. Or I could be making, you know, $2 a square foot on that, on that by renting it to a t-shirt shop or something. So, so there's a basic disconnect between the people that own and, to substanti and substantially have control over what happens in the hotel. And the people that run hotels and like us work for hotels because we actually want to serve the guests. We want to make them happy so they come back. These guys just want to do some refurbishing so they can flip the place and make a hundred million dollars on on the sale. Sale. And so you know, so we have a, a, an industry here in Hawaii where uh, you know this is our bread and butter. This is this what is we it. have. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. what we have is our beaches, and they're scooping gold off them and putting them in their pocket and taking it some other place and building uh, building something else or buying something else and what stays here in Hawaii is what stays in our members pocket and and management pocket to be fair they live here too they spend their paychecks here too mm -hmm. but the the people that work in the hotel are not the people making the decisions on this and it's not even the people that run the hotel you know, in substantial, you know, they have to dance to the tune of the owner. And not on everything, there's a lot of fighting going on between them, but my point is that we have a, a, a new situation where the people that own our means of production, the, our livelihood, our bread and butter, they don't care about hotels, they don't care about the tourists, they don't care about us, they don't care about Hawaii, they don't care what the governor says, or the mayor, or anybody else, they just don't care. You know, that, that's the problem. We're, we're dealing with people that really don't care about us, which is why in the, at the end, after we get done trying to persuade people, we have to, we have to put some push. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of you and the workers. And like I told everybody that I was out there, 
naturally, where else would I be? You know, <laughs> what else would I do but walk with the picket sign? <laughs> You got a lot of friends there, so you yes. can talk to people. <laughs> yes, Maisie walked the picket line. Mm -hmm. uh, the council candidate Tommy Waters was out. The mayor was out mm -hmm. walking the picket line. There were lots and lots yeah. of community people out yeah. there. Yeah, well, Tulsi was out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Julie and Ron off the council were out. You know, I mean, we look. You know, we we've got friends. You know, and. And that's very important when you're on strike. You, you find out who your friends are and, and who's against you. That's what a strike does. It sorts people out. When um, Thanksgiving morning, mm. we stood in line at the Lee's Bakery to buy the custard pies for the workers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a two and a half hour line. And people were saying, because I had on the red shirt and everything, and people were saying, oh, we'll get one for you. We'll, we'll get one for you. And it was amazing that people, when they knew what we were doing, added pies to the ones we were already buying. It, it's, the community support was wonderful. Yeah, and it takes a while for that to, you know, I mean, you know, we, next time we'll be quicker at this. You know, we've learned a lot of questions because... <laughs> Look, that's, the community support was always there. We could see it, people honking, you know, high-fiving us, you know, people would come off the street, you know, one tourist couple came off the street and just give $1,000 right there. And, you know, and in the, last, in the last week or so, since we've been able to put a team actually out there on the phones, you know, our, our donations to the, to the strike fund have just skyrocketed, you know, just, you know, quadrupled in pace, you know, just by act, us actually having people assigned to go call our friends and ask them for help. And so, you know, so the community support has always been buoying us up, and frankly, we deserve it. We're, we're fighting for the community here. You know, these are some of the best jobs in Hawaii. You know, some of, the, some of these, they get some nasty people on the street sometimes. Why do you think you're worth more than this or that? It's like, we're not thinking we're worth more than anybody. We want you to get a raise, too. <laughs> you, know, what, you know, we had... We had these like, guys like, you know, well, why do you think you're worth more than me? I guess like, well, maybe you should get a union, bro. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, because the fact is we're, we know what we're worth, and we know how much they're making on our worth. And that's your discussion with your boss. We will help you. You know, so we really are fighting for everybody. We, we want this one job should be enough. We want it for everybody, not just us. We want our nest nephews and nieces and all. Uh, well, surprisingly, I saw a, pro uh, a protest on the mainland, and somebody had a sign that said one job should be enough. This was in a totally different area. It wasn't a strike, mm -hmm. but here was this great big sign that says one job should be enough. That's what we're hoping for, Marsha. We, we recognize that you know, we're a union. You know, we're not a political party, we're a union. You know, our job is to deliver you know, the, the, the basic necessity of life and, and, and empower our members, right? But for us to be successful in that, we have to have a lot more than just what we can do. We can't, we can't save Medicare or Social Security on the picket line. We have to have political juice to do that. Working right. people need that. And so we're hoping that this, this one job should be enough. We're, we're consciously trying to spark a movement about that because this is the historic movement of American working people, the eight-hour day. It's what formed up our modern union movement, was the fight for the eight-hour day. We let it slip. Our generation got to try to get it back. Well, and most people don't know. They think that the weekend was in the Constitution when, in fact, it was the unions that gave us a 40-hour right. week. That's the fight the, for the eight-hour day, right? Yeah. And it's a fight for basic human rights, too, because what the slogan then and now again, eight hours for work, right, eight hours to sleep, Eight hours to do what you will. The reason working people don't get involved in politics is they're too busy. <laughs> yes. And you can't go to the hearing at 10 o'clock in the morning because you're working on your job. And so, so eight hours a day to do what you will is not just taking care of our families. Yes, we, that's what we work for. But it also gives us time to go to the PTA meeting, to go out to, go out to you know, do some political work, to support a candidate, to, to get involved in, a, in the neighborhood board or whatever. You know, it, working people shouldn't be excluded from 
government, quite the opposite. Our democracy depends on working people being involved. Otherwise, it's all the rich people getting away all the time, and we can see where that leads. It's leading us right down. You can see it happening in our country right now. You know, we have a president who's a Nazi, who's basically promoting the Klan, you know, going with this woman that wants to lynch people. I mean, we, we're challenged in our democracy right now. The hope of our society is that working people can get organized enough to counterbalance that corporate power and, and have a free and fair democracy that's fair to everyone. And I, you know, one of our pastors who had been out, you know, and but gave a, a sermon that I really thought, you know, when we opened our strike headquarters, and it just struck me, he said, you know, justice, the concept of justice is the concept of love in a social situation. That's justice nice. is how we love each other in a community by being fair to everyone. And, and that's so opposite to where the corporate billionaires and their, yeah. their, their congressional stooges and all those clowns in Congress, and they're all, they're, they're going the other way. And they're not gonna stop. No. The only thing that's gonna stop them is when they bounce off of us, working people. And we have to be powerful enough to bounce them. You know, and it's no accident, I think, that so many people in formerly blue states voted for Trump. I, I don't blame them. They lost their jobs when the Clintons took their industry and gave it off to Mexico and stuff in NAFTA. Yeah. People have been waiting 20 years to vote against the Clinton. That, that gutted their town and it took the jobs out. Their, their kids had to move out. The, the community was basically destroyed. Schools had to close. I mean, the Democrats did that. So, so they're open then to a Trump because they don't have a union anymore. Their factory went. They don't have a union that can remind them of our class interest as workers. And so they're susceptible to racism and prejudice and all that stuff. And they just want somebody who's going to shake up the tree. And, and here we have, yeah. here we have what we got. Yeah. Well, Eric, <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> for all these years of all the work you've done. And I know your mother and father are looking down and they're very proud. I'm certain of that. It, it, it's just wonderful. Thank you for being with us today. And you will come back. Well, I, I have to, Marsha. I'm one of your friends. And, <laughs> you have to. And I'm proud to be one of your friends, Marsha. You know, I mean, there's nobody who's done more than you to keep people reminded of some of the basic justice questions. and. Like I said, if we don't have justice, then, then our, the love in our community is gone. And so let's continue to fight for that. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Aloha. <laughs>